Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Golf Chat Show Live. As you can see, we've got Steve Brotherhood back on the show from the Tour Caddy Golf Experience. Caddy to Dave Horsey, welcome back to the show. How are you doing? All all right, Al? Yeah, it feels it's gone very quick since we spoke last Friday, hasn't it? Yeah, I've uh, I've been in demand actually. I've done quite a few uh, over the last week, so it's it's been quite nice. I've actually, been enjoying it talking, you know, to different people. So yeah, it's been good. Yeah, I, I, it's weird. Like someone said to me yesterday, um, you've been doing this every night since lockdown. Is it getting a bit boring? But I said no, actually no, because like hearing stories from from the likes of people like you speaking to other people and then like play football who play golf and I think it's just a great opportunity just to share a few stories absolutely and it's a perfect time to do it because you know I think if you were to ask me if I'd do it every Friday night why I was out on tour I'd probably have to say you know maybe once but you know why yeah. we're doing nothing we sit at home then we could spare an hour here and there so yeah it's good Exactly. Well, thanks very much for coming on the show again. I know uh, we've got a really good uh, reception last time and everybody liked your stories. Um, and uh, we sort of alluded at the end of the show last time that we just sort of uh, were scratching the surface of what we could actually talk about. But before we get into uh, all these questions that I've got you got for you from all the viewers, um, I want to get into you're, you're, you're raising money for a great cause. Um, yeah. Well, two great courses, in fact. Um, yeah. So just give us a little bit more information on that. I know I just put it on my Twitter. So if anybody you watching this now, um, head over to my Twitter after you've finished watching and check it out and follow this great two great courses. Brilliant. Yeah, so um, for, for, for people that don't know, uh, my little boy, Henry, who's nine years old now, was diagnosed with autism for over the last two years. Um, we've always known he's been a little bit different since the age of two, um, but he never ticked all the boxes. So they wouldn't, um, label him if you like until mm. just a couple of years ago so um, for people that don't know that uh, if you're deaf and dumb or if you're blind there are assistance dogs that help these people out well there's a there's a company uh, charity in Manchester now uh, who I've come, become very friendly with who do assistant dogs for autistic children now uh, when I heard about this I had to go and check it out and see what it was and these dogs and these people that train them are incredible. And we've basically um, just signed up to get uh, my boy Henry, one of these assistant dogs. And he's been partnered with a, a dog called Ralph, who's a, a little black lab. He's nine months old. We spent the last three weeks with him just bonding. Uh, he's still a pet at the minute, um, but he's just gone back on Saturday to do the training. So 50% um, of the money uh, is going to the autistic job dog charity and then obviously the other 50 percent is going to our wonderful nhs staff that um that risk their lives every day at the minute going into work and not knowing whether they'll catch this terrible disease or not and um you know i just think between us caddies at the talk Caddy experience and i i spoke to every single one of them and said look i think we need to do something um you know give something back um Pretty much every one of them was on board with it. And what we decided to do was give, uh, do a raffle for £10 a go. And the first place would be a four ball um, with one of our caddies. So we've got 40 odd all over the world. Now, if someone was to enter and none of our caddies were close to them, we said as an alternative, we would set up a Zoom call like this and uh, have an hour with you and just ask, answer any questions we can basically aimed at your game and see if we can help you in that kind of way. So I've had a really good response so far. Uh, this is the the voucher for ball with one of our caddies. But since I started doing it, a few of my friends have got on board. Dan Parrott, one of the caddies, has donated a signed open flag uh, by Jordan Spieth. Uh, That's which, seriously cool. Which is a brilliant prize. <laughs> um, we have got, let me just get my list. Robert Coles, who's an ex-European tour player, has donated a one-hour lesson and nine holes playing with him at his golf course in Essex, Golf Kingdom, which is brilliant again. Uh, a one-hour lesson and nine holes playing with Phil Archer at Poulton Park in Warrington. We've got a dozen Callaway Triple X golf balls and a Callaway hat and a Tour Caddy Experience Valuables pouch. Uh, so and there is more prizes to come i've had messages off people they're going to dig some stuff out and i'll keep promoting it on my tour caddy experience uh, social media side twitter instagram and facebook so anyone wants to go please donate well let's get a big fat check for these two brilliant charities like i know you're raising money for two great brilliant charities but as prizes they're, they're like things money can't buy yeah i mean the, the one i mean just going back to 
Caddy's doing something, uh, Ian Finno, uh, Finnis, who's uh, Caddy for Tommy Fleetwood, go follow his page at the minute. Um, he's in, he's doing an incredible job, by the way. He's off his own back. He decided a few weeks ago to to set up a raffle, just like I've done, yeah. ten pound ago, uh, and donate some of his signed memorabilia. And it was like signed flags with Tommy on um, the best players in the world. But all of a sudden, he's had all the friends and uh, golfers that have come to him and said, "Oh, I'll donate something." And just about an hour ago, Rory McIlroy sent him his signed golf bag that he won the tour championship with last year. It's money can't buy this. You no. know, it's incredible. And it's a ten pound ago, and. All these proceeds are going to us caddies, the uh, European Tour Caddy Association, um, that are going to be struggling at these times. You know, we only get paid when we go to work. And obviously, this we don't know when we're going back to work. So a lot of the caddies are going to find it hard at this time. And all that money that he's raising is going to be uh, split between all his caddies. And at the minute, last time I checked, about 10 minutes ago, he's earned £98,000, which... He, you know, superheroes don't always wear capes. And for me, he's uh, he's a proper superhero. So hats off to, to Ian Finnis. Where, 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 where do I find out how much he's raised so far? If you on go, to, if, if you follow, do you follow him on Twitter at all? Yeah, yeah. So well, go, let's check now, let's see where it's at. Yes. So go go to Ian Finnis on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, on, his, on his bio, you'll see the GoFundMe page there. Ah, perfect. Let's click on it. But I'm, I'm, I, I remember looking ten minutes ago. It was about ninety eight thousand quid. Yeah, it's nearly, nearly at ninety nine thousand. There you go. He, and he also said one of his comments was about an hour ago, if uh, if it gets to a hundred grand by tomorrow night, which is going to comfortably, um, he will donate his signed caddy bib from the U.S. Open when Tommy shot the course record of sixty three, along with the card and a signed hat. I think it was of Tommy. So. These prizes you you can't get your hands on that you know unless you're at an auction paying thousands of thousands of pounds and it's only ten pound ago so get on mine get on Finno's you know twenty quid out of your pocket and you've got a really good chance of making you know winning some good prizes. Fantastic, just fantastic, and hopefully obviously raise money for the caddies, but then also the two two great charities that you're doing it for as well. Yeah, fantastic. So let's get into the questions. Okay, yep. so um, I'm ready. <laughs> it's uh, what I'm going. This is kind of basically we, we've titled the show tonight, um, "How to Become a European Tour Caddy." And these are the things that um, I wanted to ask you about. Almost like, imagine you were going to caddy school or wh whatever we're going to call it. Um, is there yeah. anything that you need? So, first question on our list is special training. Is there any special training required for the job? There's no sort of school or uh, training that, as far as I know, out there that you you go to like to become a, a caddy so there's no courses you can do um i think you get dropped in at the deep end whenever you start as a caddy um from whether you've started 30 years ago or whether you're about to go out today now it's such a difficult job to get into these days because there's more caddies than there are players now i've been out on tour 16 years and fortunately i've never really been out of a job for more than a couple of weeks so i've been very lucky but there is caddies that come out on a weekly basis now that haven't got a job, mm -hmm. that have got many more years experience than myself, that are sitting there in the locker room on a Tuesday morning hoping that a player turns up without a caddy. Um, so it's a very, very difficult job. And, and the, the game's changed a little bit because there's a lot more friends, wives, girlfriends, um, brothers, family members coming out, carrying the bag for people now. So... Obviously, when they bring friends and family out, that's another job that a caddy could have could have been in. So yeah. it is very difficult. So no, there's no no kind of course or, or, or way to go to to become a caddy. Uh, and you know, you just have to. I, I suppose if you are non-experienced caddy, you'll be coming out with a friend. Uh, not many players take a guy just off the street that they don't know that's never had any experience being on the bag, if you like. Mm. Now, I know you mentioned there about some guys turning up and um, praying on a Tuesday to get a bag. Do they usually get a bag or not? Is it is it hit no. and miss? No. no. Uh, there was a couple of caddies early on in the year when we, we actually were out on tour and uh, they flew all the way out to like Saudi Arabia and, and Doha. Didn't didn't get a job, you know, and it's, it's a long way. They're paying money out of their own pockets, flights, accommodation, 
and with the the hope that they get uh, a job and that you know they haven't done so like i said it's very very difficult later on in the year normally when uh, when the fields are bigger when there's more players playing there's a more of a chance but because the, the um, at the start of the year it's limited fields of about 128 players i believe it is um you know that's about 30 30 bags that uh, have been been limited so hmm. yeah it's, it's a struggle. that is I mean, you wouldn't you wouldn't even realise that, like, unless obviously you guys um, tell the story. For um, me, it's not worth the gamble. I, I would not pay that kind of money to go all the way across the world and and sit there without a job. It's 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 too much of a gamble. If if I was guaranteed a job, obviously you'd go. But it's it's uh, yeah, it's a no win situation we're in there. Especially like going to like the the first few events to Saudi Arabia. I guess they're probably looking at it and saying, well. These events are big money events that start the year, uh, especially at Desert Swing. Yeah, absolutely. If you know. they if they get a good bag, potentially someone doesn't turn up, a caddy gets ill, and they could. Yeah, that's the, I think that's the only real chance you've got is if someone takes ill or gets injured, because there's not many players go to a Rolex event, if you like, like Abu Dhabi, without a caddy. That you know, it's the start of the year; they're all set up, we're all ready to go. You know who's going to be working for you. It's not very often they'll turn up on the off chance that unless it's like a player gets injured or or takes ill and pulls out and then a first reserve is there, like a player's there as first yeah. reserve out of caddy, then there's a chance you might drop on. But uh, again, it's um, it's not likely. No. Oh, that is crazy. Yeah, it's, it's hard. <laughs> yeah. Um, so number two on our list, um, what do you carry in your bib? What are the essentials that you have to have in there? Three pencils. Three. Three. Uh, is, that though? is that I, a superstition now? Is that a superstition now? No, it's because I lose two pretty much <laughs> around. <laughs> uh, no, I always have three pencils. I, I, I get a picture repairer just in case, um, you know, we, we walk by one or we, you know, play and misses one and you're there to do it. Um, your stats card and your yardage book. And just to give us a little bit of an insight on that yardage book, because I know a lot of you guys have your own covers for them, don't you? Um, I, I, I absolutely love them. I think it's super cool. It's funny because I was going through all my yardage books today. So as you can see, I've labelled where, where they are now. Um, but yeah, uh, these yardage books are very, very detailed. They're very, very good. Uh, as you can see, there's the, uh, the numbers. So uh, all these numbers are to the front of the green. We get a, a distance to the back of the green. These pictures that you can see, we have uh, carries and run out. So if there's a bunker there, for example, uh, it tells you what it is to run out on line with that trap. So the, the yardage books these days are very, very good. And I think, well, I know that's why players are not sometimes not so much taking caddies and bringing family members out because it's, it's very self-explanatory with the books. So... Um, yeah, the books are very, very good. Would you take, would you, have you kept them for a purpose? So for when you go yes. to the next year, you know what the yeah, flags are? Exactly. So, um, you know, we have every year the flags pretty much stay the same unless we obviously go to a different golf course and it's a new yardage book. So what we'll do, we'll get our new yardage book on the Tuesday morning when we get to the golf course, cross reference it with last year's book, make any notes that we need to. And then when we're out on the golf course, we're obviously making our notes and we can cross reference it again see where the flags are. So again, in practice rounds, um, I have a, like a little fake round hole. So I will go and put a spot out where the four flags are. Um, and then when Dave gets to the green, he can practice his putting to, to where those holes have been the, the previous years to give him a bit of an idea. That's got to be so valuable. I mean, I know you're caddying for Dave Horsey, but for whoever um, you're caddying for, Having that information, putting the flags down, where they're going to be. If that player's not been there before, even if they have, they probably don't remember. No, absolutely, and that's and that's what we get paid for. That's our job, you know, to do to do that and to make notes of that and to know for the following year we're almost hundred percent prepared before that we go into the practice round. We know where things are going to be. Um, we've got our little plastic holes, and you know, and it, it, like you say, it's invaluable really to practice those putts, especially if you get very grainy greens like in Malaysia or um, China, places like that, um, where, you know, the grain goes one way, the break goes the other. So it's, it's pretty good to practice your putting around where you think the hole's going to be for that, you know, for day one, two, three and four. 
And what kind of notes do you do you put in them? So when you go on a practice round and you and Dave are saying, is it highlighting trouble or is it highlighting lines? What what kind Absolutely. of thing? You don't you don't want to be negative, so you don't want to show your player that you're you're highlighted in trouble as such. But um, see if I can find a page where I might have scribbled on it. Uh, okay, so where's this? South Africa Ned Bank, um, which is Sun City Golf Club. We call that the Caddy Graveyard because it is the most terrific golf course to caddy round in your life why it's, why why it mean? It's, all, it's all about the wind um i stood on the 16th hole last time i was there 16th hole is it might be this book actually let's have a look so 16th hole is a par through 174 yards okay behind the green is a flag at the top of the top of the stand that's blowing left to right okay to my left there's a flag blowing right to left <laughs> the flag behind me is blowing straight down and you get on that tee and you've got to give you your man a yardage and tell him where the wind is. And I remember in practice, uh, and I was kidding for Mark Warren at the time, and he said, where's, where's the wind here, bro? I said, I've no idea. I, I said, it's left to right, right to left and down. I said, I've, I've just no idea. I mean, look, and we looked around at the flags and it was just, the wind swirls so much around there. It's, it's incredible. Um, but on the third hole there, you can see just big, big crosses, anything Anything right of those bunkers is dead. So, you know, we yeah. know uh, going down there, he, he can't miss this green right and all down the left is OK. So just little simple, simple but effective notes we, we've put in there because you're not going to remember every hole of every golf course. So, you know, looking at that second shot there, if the flag's tucked in quite tight to the right hand side, you give him a, a pin position, which is going to be a couple of yards left of it. Sure. So uh, you, know, you mentioned there when you get to a tee, uh, you say you give them the wind and, and, and the kind of what you think they should hit or what what is the process that you go to? So you imagine you get to a shot, we'll say middle of the fairway. What's the process you go through as a caddy to give your player the numbers and the wind or whatever? What do you do? So all, all, all players are different. Some players like you to give you everything. Some players like minimal. Some people like just get the uh, get the numbers and then you ask them. Now, for example, I'll, I'll start with Dave, who I, who I work for now. Um, he likes me to give him the information. So I'll, I'll basically pace to the, the spot that's on the fairway to get the number. So I will say to Dave, right, we've got 154 the front, the flag's 20 on, 174. That's all he wants first off. And then he'll ask me, where's the wind, if there is any at all. Uh, and I'll say, it's downwind, what's it playing? I'll say it's playing one six four, okay. And then, then I have to ask him, "What are you thinking?" And he'll then talk to me, and he'll process the shot in his mind, right? Because it's the right flag. I fancy just holding a little seven iron in there, taking a bit off it, or um, if it's a left flag because it's downwind, I'm going to draw a hard eight in there. So he tells me the shot. So I've got a picture in my mind of what shot he's got in his mind, and then. Nine times out of ten, we're on the same page. But if for any reason I disagree with it, then it's up to me then to step in. I said, well, hang on, you can't miss that that green to the right there. So let's aim at the left side of the green, hit the cut shot. If it gets to the middle of the green 20 feet, it's a good shot, you know. And you have to sell it to your player. Um, because they know that we've been out there on the Tuesday, the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, doing our notes, and we know where the trouble is. It's not like I'll say... Dave, you can't miss this green right because straight away then he's got a negative in his mind that if he misses, he's going to pull it left because he can't miss it right. So you have to word it right to say, I like the shot where we're going to aim up the left side and just fade it into that that hole. So it's, a- it's almost like, okay, you've got that image in your head. This is the image that I've got in my head. And without saying, don't go there, don't miss that. <laughs> exactly. And you have to you have to be very good and word it right. And that's, that's what I'm talking about. Like you asked me the question to start off, you know, getting into the game, getting into caddying. You know, if you don't know that kind of stuff, um, you know, the players sometimes rely on that. So, yeah. you know, you need to be, you need to, just as a little thing like that, you need to be up on it and you need to know, you know, you know your player. That's what makes a good caddy, I guess. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, number three on our list. Um, top three rules that if you had a caddy rule book would yeah. be in uh, Turn up on time is, is the... <laughs> yeah, you've, but... you've got to be there before your player, simple as. If you turn up a minute late after meeting him, you know, I, I'm pretty sure they'll be okay, but you don't want to be late. You want to be there before your player. Yeah. Um, number two is 
um, on the golf course, always keep up with them. I think, you know, you don't want to be 50 yards behind them having to do the yard is you then running up, getting out of breath, getting flustered, rushing stuff. So always keep up with your player. Don't matter how bad or how good the round is, try and keep either in front or, or level with him at least. That would be my number two. And number three, shut up. <laughs> and the reason why I say shut up is because sometimes we can get a little bit too enthusiastic. We can go into the shot or we can go into um, sort of describing what we want to happen too much. So keep it to a minimum. Keep it to how they want it. Don't get overexcited. Don't get too ahead of yourself. Um, and just, yeah, on time, keep up and shut up. That was, that's my three. Yeah, just on that keep up, who's the fastest player you've 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 carried for? So who's the one where you've had to feel like you're running to every shot? Um I don't think I've ever really carried for anyone that's really fast as such, but um Simon Dyson being out in his group when he was out on tour, you know, it's like a whippet coming out of the blocks, you know, it's you know, catch the hair kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. uh, he he was always very a quick walker. Uh, Adrianus um, is so slow over the ball, but coming off the tee, he runs. Um, yeah, they're, they're the two. Oh, uh, well, obviously, the, the Renato Paratori is the fastest player on the planet. Yeah. He, by far, walking, hitting, you know, you, you could, your player could have hit. By the time you've put, gone to get the divot, you're, he's already hit. He's gone. And it's like sometimes you get caught out because you obviously yeah. want to keep still. Don't want to be making any noise over their shot, but sometimes he's that quick. You can't, you can't help it. I bet, but, yeah, I bet, I bet you get him in the wrong position, don't you? Like absolutely. behind, behind him or an awkward spot. Yeah. And he's he's the fastest I've uh, I've ever been out with. That's for sure. Okay, next question on the list, and this is one that I've been asking a few people. Um, so it's not a caddy related question, but it's it's a question to you about. Rory said um, the Ryder Cup should not go ahead without fans. Now, what are your thoughts on that? Because the, at the Ryder Cup is like our version of the Super Bowl, isn't it? Absolutely. Like fans are raucous. There's um, pe- this is probably the only time we can kind of go, well, we're going to have a football atmosphere. We don't have to be stood there quiet. And I guess that's why we all probably love it and love being yeah. a part of it and love watching it. There's no there's no point in doing a Ryder Cup without the first tee fans around that first tee. You know, you they, they walk onto that first tee and the reception that both teams get is just incredible. Billy Foster said, um, I, you know, I do a podcast for the, for the caddies and um, in his podcast he did with me, he said, walking onto that first tee when Darren Clark, he was caddying for Darren Clark and he just lost his wife six weeks before the Ryder Cup um, through cancer. And he said, Billy went onto the tee first and he said it's the first time he's ever cried on a golf course. He said the the reception for Darren walking onto that tee was just mm-hmm. something he'll never ever ever forget, and I just don't see the point in having it. You know, what's the point in having a Ryder Cup without all them cheering fans? You know, you watch it here on TV, and you see a shot, you don't know what's happening, you do until it lands, until it see it finished. Where when you hit a shot, you hear the commentators, you hear the crowd, you hear, you know, and it gives you that little bit of a buzz. It's more exciting, and you know you. You're watching Rory and Pulse going, come on, to who? To the purpose. <laughs> yeah. Waste of time in my eyes. And also the revenue that the Ryder Cup brings in, the money that the Ryder Cup brings into the toy, he's unbelievable. And that's all through the fans and the sponsors. If you haven't got any fans there, you're not making much revenue. So for me, if we have to miss it a year, we miss it. But something, something to look forward to next year, isn't it? Sure, exactly. And I, I always think, I remember, it might have been Luke Donald that said this, that he could, he found it hard just to tee the golf ball up. Yeah. Like, was that nervous, that much pressure, that many bands? Shaking. They must be absolutely shaking in the booth. Just, you know, just scared of missing it or topping it or making the fool yourself on the first tee. But I think as soon as they get into it, it's like anything. You, you're there, you've done it, you're out of your way. Um, but, you know, like Billy said, for Darren Clark, even to be able to hit that golf ball on the first tee with all the emotions, with everyone there supporting him, uh, and he flushed it 300 yards straight down the middle. You know, incredible. That and that's, takes, what, and that's the char- character of the man. Yeah. Okay, back on to a caddy question. Um, yeah. Do you have to be a good player to be a caddy? Now, I, I always think this is quite an interesting one because it's the first thing that a person who's not associated with tour golf or not associated with 
potentially knowing what happens behind the scenes, they would go, oh, well, you know, you have to be a, at least a scratch player to become a, a tour caddy. Couldn't be further from the truth. Sure. I bet there's a, I bet I could count 20 lads that are two or three handicap or under. Mm. The rest will be mid to very high handicappers. Um, they're not very good golfers, but they're very good caddies. Doesn't doesn't take that away from them. You know, you um, a lot of them don't play anymore. A lot of them think, you know, they've been out for 30 weeks on tour. The last thing you want to do when you go on your week home is go and play golf. I'm a little bit different. I play on a Saturday. We've got a good group of lads at my home course at Newark. Um, we have a chuck up that's normally between 30 and 60 of us every Saturday morning. You chuck a fiver in each, winner takes a lot, buys the first round, and we have a really nice social beer after. And it's a good laugh, you know. Um, but no, you don't have to be a good, good uh, player to be a caddy, that's for sure. Yeah, because I, I, I was speaking to somebody about this today, and I was saying, well, just because you're a good player doesn't make doesn't make you a good caddy in the sense Absolutely. that doesn't make because a lot of good players I'm, just, I'm saying like kind of club golfers will still probably have terrible course management and like you said before not knowing what what the right things to say at the right time and Absolutely. you could almost argue that it probably helps you as long as you obviously understand the golf and have an understanding of what shots your player hits probably yeah. helps you being subjective and not being a very good golfer at all. Absolutely, yeah, because again, it depends what what kind of player you're working for, but you know if you if you get a bit too much and you you see the shot as a good goal for yourself, you you might be overstepping the mark by telling him, oh, no, it's this shot you should be playing, where actually he's the man that's making the decision on the shot, you're giving the advice. Um, so it can work as a negative in a way if, you, if you're that good a golfer. I know Sammy Haywood, for example, who caddies for Danny Willett now, he's a really, really good golfer. Um, and... He, he had it around the Masters. Danny took him for a practice round in the Masters a week before the Masters, and he shot 73. Um, bogeyed the last to, to to beat Danny, I think, or draw with him at least. Uh, you know, so that proves he's a very, very good golfer, and he can, you know, play on one of the toughest golf courses in the world, if you like. Um, but then other course, other other caddies that I know probably wouldn't break 150 around there. Yeah. So, so yeah, you don't you don't have to be a, a a good player to be a caddy. That's for sure. Next question. Um, what's the worst thing you can say to your player as a caddy? Uh, can I have a pay rise? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that probably is. <laughs> um, it depends all on the situation, I think. You again, you you need to when you when you start a relationship with a player, you need to know what makes them tick, what makes them happy, what makes them sad. Uh, when they are down in the dumps, what gets them back up, up and upbeat, and when they are upbeat, how to keep them there. So it's almost a matter of saying the right things at the right time and not saying the wrong things, you know. Um, and again, it depends what you can and can't get away with with the player that you're working for. So it all depends on the scenario you're in, I think. Okay, fair, fair enough. I was hoping we'd uh, get some bit of, bit, bit of something there. No, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not sure I've, I'm not sure I've said anything... Um, so bad that uh oh i tell you i did yes I, okay there is a story. <laughs> yeah, we've got it eventually <laughs> the lights have just come on so <laughs> i, I caddied for mark warren for about probably nine ten weeks um and was at the portugal masters mm -hmm. and it was my second event with him now he was 175th on the order of merit he was losing his card and um, I was asked to do the last sort of six events of the year with him uh, and then go to tour school with him because he, you know, it wasn't looking likely he was going to get his card. And the management company he was with is the same management company with as, as I was working for Howler. Howler was injured. I was asked to, to go on the bag for Mark. So I did. So second event, Portugal Masters. So got off to an unbelievable start. We're lying two, two behind or something going into the last round. So uh, on the... On the Sunday, we're on the 17th. Now, if he finishes top three, there's a chance of keeping his card in one week, you know. So he needs a really good week somewhere. And we're going down the uh, 17th hole, par five, <laughs> and he's, uh, he's one behind the leader. So we stand on the um, second shot. And as, we, as I'm walking up to the second shot, sorry, uh, he's got a little bit of an uphill lie, par five, 
over water um you know really good hole but uh, you know rewardable what a hole if you get your driveway and he's got his driveway he's long down there he's got probably a three iron in so as i'm walking down to the ball i said i can remember a few years ago i, I carried one week i did a one week with james hepworth and he had the best three iron i've ever seen off from a similar place that you are big high cut to a bat right flag hit it to three feet not knowingly that I've put a, something in his mind there um, yeah. because he hit it to three feet. And then I followed up by saying, oh, and then he, then he three whacked it, believe it or not. Um, so anyway, we get over the shot. It's a three iron. It's the same flag. It's a bat right flag. And I've give him, given the yardage and he's hit an absolute beauty, straight middle of the green, perfect. And he's chucked me the club and he's gone, do me one favour. Never ever mention a shot that another player's hit when I'm about to walk up to it. And when I look back at it after, I thought, God, yeah, what a terrible thing to say. You know, I mean, I, I could have could have been even worse and said, oh, I sprayed it in the water, but that wouldn't have been a conversation you probably would have brought up. But I was, it was almost like I thought if I told him, you know, this guy yeah. thought it might be a, it wasn't. It went totally the wrong way. So, um, so that's probably one of the things I shouldn't have said at the time. Now, how did he, did he, did he, what did he go on to do? He, he, he finished second and, and got his card and then we had an unbelievable run uh, and he ended up finishing top 60 and went to the race to the buy as well, so. You know, I remember that because he went well in Turkey, didn't he? Was yeah, it? he did, he did well, well, he did well in the, in every event really, finished fourth at um, the Dunhill Links, 14th at the British Masters, um, top 20 in, in Turkey uh, and then gets us into the race to buy. He made £707,000 in the last six events to, so it was amazing, really. What I, 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 I was very lucky. I dropped on when he's, uh, his game turned around. So it was yeah. good. And like, it's, it's funny sometimes that you, you see that a player gets a fresh set of eyes, a fresh conversation, something totally different. Yeah. And it's the spark, isn't it? Yeah, the amount of times that you finish with a player and the week after he has a brilliant result. Um, and the reason why you finish with him is because then, you know, you're not gelling, he's not playing very well or whatever. But the week after, when he starts with a new fresh face on the bag, it's almost like, yeah, you know he's going to have a good week. Such interesting stories. That's a great story to finish us off there. Thanks, Steve, for coming on again. I really appreciate yeah, it. Right, no problem. Um, that is just some fantastic insights, what it takes, and our, I'm going to say our rule book to becoming a European Tour caddy. Yeah. Uh, now, on a serious note, guys, don't forget to head over to mine and the Tour Caddy Golf Experience Twitter. Great causes there, as well as Ian Finnis. Um, some great things are happening uh, to raise some money for three great causes. So make sure you support them and I'll leave all the links on my Twitter so you can find them a little bit easier. Thanks for watching guys and we'll see you tomorrow.